Psalms chapter 23. We began last time to say that there were going to be seven things that we were going to look at that were all going to be relative to the character of God. Oftentimes when we look at the psalm and we talk about sheep and the nature of sheep and where sheep are, but the psalm really addresses much about, about the shepherd, who the shepherd is. And, and so we began to talk about how uh, David wrote this psalm probably toward the end of his life and all the things that had accumulated in his life are, are in his mental uh, mind as he's writing these things. So as he says this, he's remembering any number of incidences that have happened, how sin has captured him in different ways. I mentioned last time how that uh, God would not allow David to build the temple because he, he had been such a violent king. Um, and so God said, I, I don't need you being the one who builds my temple. And just by way of, I guess, compare, that'd be like a politician being endorsed by the town drunk. And, and God is saying, I, I really, you're such a violent person, and, and that's what people know you about, and so I, I don't need you building my house. Solomon will do that. And so we talked about some of what might have motivated David as he wrote this psalm, and we looked at uh, the first part of the psalm, the fact that it begins, Yahweh is my shepherd. His personal name uh, is, is, is the one who is our shepherd, our caretaker. And because that is true, we are in a position where we don't have a single want because our caretaker is Yahweh himself. And so we are without want. He makes us to do what we need to do, to lie down in green pastures. He takes us to quiet waters. He restores our soul and he, he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, that's his purpose. He, he, he wants us to be a good example of what he does in the lives of people who let him be their shepherd. And so we got that far last time and today we're going to continue as we look at the promises of Yahweh. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, you are with me. This is perhaps one of the most utilized texts at funeral services and memorial services uh, because, it simply, because it mentions death. That even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the New American Standard actually gives a, a side rendering, an alternate rendering to the, the passage as the valley of deep darkness. The reason for that is because the Hebrew word actually means doom or dark or depressed. So even though I walk through the, the doom, the darkness that is like death, you're with me. You're with me. Uh, I want you to notice something. This is the valley of the shadow of death. It's not death. This is a valley where the darkness is like death. And he says, even though I walk through that valley, that you are with me. And life is just, life is filled with many dark shadows that feel like death. Or maybe even some dark shadows that we wish were. So the idea that's being expressed here isn't about physical death per se, as much as it is that we have valleys that we go through, that our shepherd is there because those valleys are so dooming to us. They're so depressing to us. that that's, that's where our Yahweh is. That's where our God is. The point here is that there are no shadows that work against or work harm to the shepherd's ability to shepherd. There are no shadows that destroy his influence. You know, shadows are not reality, are they? A shadow is just that. It's a shadow. It's not what's real. It's what is being cast and what's being seen, what's being looked at. Uh, the shadow of a dog doesn't bite. Don't have to worry about the dog's shadow. Now, the one that's got his teeth bared at you, you maybe need to keep your eye on. The shadow of a sword doesn't cut anybody. And so here, this psalmist says... I have this valley that is so dark and so gloom. And his point is, the shadow is just a shadow. It has no real power. It has no real reality over me. I, I thought of this, uh, and, and this just makes so much sense. If you keep your, your eyes on the light, what shadow do you ever see? If you keep your vision on the light, you'll never see a shadow. It's when we take our, our vision off of the light that the shadows are there. Not only are they there, but the more distant we get from the light, what happens to the shadow? 
It grows. It gets bigger. And if I'm paying attention to the shadows of my life, I will distance myself from God the light, Yahweh the light, and the shadow will, will gain strength. And the psalmist says that, that there's no need for that because God is always there. The light is always present, and so the shadow has no real effect on me. This reality means that there is no reason for fear, and so I will fear no evil. The shadows are there, but so is my shepherd, so I don't fear any evil because the shepherd is along with the sheep, never alone. All right, raise your left hand. This is not a hard exercise. Just raise your left hand. God, I know you're there. You created me brave. So I have nothing to fear because you love me and will protect me through Jesus. Amen. There's your pocket prayer. It's always going to be in your left hand. That's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying Yahweh is always going to protect. Fifthly, the rod and the staff are going to comfort me. Protection is always going to be there from God. The Hebrew word for rod means a root or a stick for fighting. Uh, it's not just a stick. Um, it's more probably appropriately thought of as a club. If you want to think of a baseball bat, you probably get a pretty good vision. You can imagine being hit with a baseball bat. There were some who even embedded metal in their rods. So imagine being hit with a baseball bat that has nails sticking out of it. You get some idea of the kind of protection that the shepherd is going to provide. And his staff also provides support uh, and help. It's a walking stick, a protector. Obviously, we are familiar with what those implements look like. There would be the rod for beating off attackers, and there would be the staff which primarily would be used for the security of the sheep itself. So the shepherd protects against attacks. And that's where the psalmist gets, the reason, the reason I don't have to have any fear, the reason the shadows don't bother me, is because God is there always protecting me. And he will protect me against attacks from without. Because he's got a rod that's embedded with the blood of Jesus. And he's got this rod and he will protect me from everything that attacks me on the outside. So when I stand up for what a Christian is, when I'm making a stand at work and others are not understanding that, God's going to protect me. God's going to protect me. When, I, when I'm in, in an environment where I'm, I'm asked to do something and I decide that as a Christian I'm not going to get involved in that and I take that stand and I stake it boldly, God's going to protect me. He's going to protect me from outside attacks. And, and isn't that great? God's going to protect me. But you know something that's even more amazing? God's going to protect me from myself. Anybody here need to be protected from yourself? Yeah. Do you ever have your mind, you know, your attitudes, the stinking thinking ever invade? Do, do you ever find non-Christian thoughts overwhelming your desires, your, your, what, you, what you're going to do. And God has a staff. <laughs> and he takes that staff and he says, okay, you're my sheep. And I, Okay, when, when I walk our pup, if she is dilly-dallying on the walk, I mean, my purpose is a walk. Not to smell where every dog has been. But she, when, when she dilly-dallies, she gets a little jerk on the leash. And the little command, walk. Okay, so here I am. Walk. And, and, this, and she's pretty much got it down now, but she needs protection from herself, in my opinion. My wife's opinion, not so much. <laughs> you and I, as sheep in... God's care. We need to be protected from ourselves, And we can be thankful that sometimes God takes that staff and he puts that crook around our neck and he gives us a yank. And he says, 
walk. Be who you're supposed to be. Remember what Jesus died for. Remember how you're supposed to show me. And, and he is protecting us constantly from ourselves. And maybe that is as significant or maybe even more significant than protecting us from things that come outside. My wife said I might sing a solo. I'm hoping people know this song because the words fit so well. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide in every change he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. The shepherd protects. Number six, Yahweh also is our prosperity. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. The setting now changes, and we said in the introduction, the first part of the psalm is an outdoor setting. You have a shepherd and sheep. Now we have switched indoors, and we have a host, and we have guests. God is the host in this house, and we are the guest in this, this house. The, characteriz the characterization of God switches from shepherd to host. <clears throat> One thing that um, I'll, I'll try to be brief upon, but if you're curious, you do some investigation and some reading about the, the concept of hospitality in, mid, in the Mideastern part of the world. It is so much different than America's. You know, I remember growing up in the North, and I, I've heard this since I was a kid, there's nothing like Southern hospitality. Okay, and as one who never lived in the South... And nothing against it. I'm not, there's no prejudice. But as one who's never lived in the South, I kind of thought Northern hospitality was pretty good. Well, of course, I have tasted some Southern fried chicken that makes me wonder. But we have, we have parts of our country that we, we visualize with being hospitable. Okay? Compared to the rest, probably most of the rest of the world, our concept of hospitality stinks. Because in most of the rest of the world, when people are being hospitable, you are the beneficiary of something they sacrifice. I had a, a, a nephew who, who was doing mission work, was going overseas for mission work, and part of their training in doing that was if, if you're invited by people to their home, you'd better go. It will be insulting to them if you don't. Okay. In America, you know, hey, what's coming? Well, you know, I got, I got something. Let me check my calendar. Uh, you know, that's over there. If you're invited, you better go. Went so far as to even describe some of the things that people may offer you to eat, which may not be on the menu at McDonald's in America. And the encouragement was, you eat it. Because regardless of what it is, people have given up eating that themselves, and they are offering it to you. And the whole, the whole mental attitude of, of hospitality in that part of the world is so much different. So when, when David writes about the Lord giving this feast, the Lord preparing this table, Yahweh having us set down. This, this is God giving of himself, sacrificing of himself for our benefit. 
This isn't just good old southern hospitality. This is divine hospitality. And the Mideasterners would have seen this much differently than how we read it. So it says he sets a table before his people. It, can, can you imagine, can't you just visualize the God of heaven setting a table for us? My mom used to set a pretty decent Thanksgiving table, except for the one time that she thought we should have cold squash soup. And, and she learned one time, never again. And, and you know, we, we have huge family gatherings and family reunions and all of this, this feast. Imagine what God sets for his sheep in this attitude of hospitality of the Mideastern way of thinking. He sets a table for his people. He tends to their needs and he does so right in front of their enemies. The Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. What's so significant about that? I didn't invite them. Did you? Are you going to invite your enemies to the table? So God says, I'm going to feed my sheep, my people, in front of their enemies. And the Hebrew word actually means those who, those who cramp you. You know, we've heard of cramp your style. Enemies are a major cramp in your style. And God says, the psalmist says, God prepares the table for, before, before me right in front of the people that are cramping my style. Oh, you think you can work harm to my my. My child, you think you can harm my sheep? <laughs> oh, guess again. Here's the feast they're going to eat. No mention that God lets them eat. You prepare it before them. So whatever evil we face, whatever enemies we face, we need to understand God is going to do what he needs to do <laughs> to feed us in front of them. To make our objective, his objective, his righteousness in us to make that stand out above those who are trying to work us harm. And this isn't just a nice, th this is till your cup overflows. Till your cup overflows. You've done that a time or two, haven't you? My wife went visiting. We had first moved to this community and the lady that invited her over was uh, blind. And she invited Becky over for cookies and coffee. So Becky's sitting at the table, wide-eyed, because a blind lady is pouring a cup of coffee. And she's thinking, this could be interesting. Well, she was so trained that her thumb resting on the top of the cup could feel the heat. And she knew when to stop. And the cup didn't overflow. And Becky didn't have to worry about that. There was a pencil in her cookie, though, so that's another story. A son had left a golf pencil on top of her flower canister. And she didn't know it was there. So as she took off the lid, dropped into the flower, went into the cookies, got baked into a cookie. Can you imagine, Becky, uh, 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 trying to be quiet about this? You know, the lady can't see this. But she sensed, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong? Well, there's a pencil in my cookie. Oh, that JD. Okay, so... God gives us cups that overflow, not by mistake, on purpose. So much. Remember the story of the widow and the oil? You get as many containers as you can get, and the oil's going to keep coming as long as you have containers. Guess how long God keeps the oil coming when the containers run out? He's still blessing. He's still offering, overflowing. Reminds me of this text. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, who from, who, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would give you according to the riches. I want to just catch the words of extravagance, the overflowing words, okay? That he would give you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being firmly rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond 
all that we ask or understand according to the power that works within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever amen amen, amen. God's cup just keeps getting full just overflows be still my soul thy Lord doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past thy hope thy con Confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. who ruled them while he dwelt below. Lastly, the presence, the presence of God. Surely goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Goodness, <clears throat> the Hebrew just means good in the fullest sense. In other words, it, there's nothing bad can be found. This is just 100% good, totally good. It could be translated as beautiful, as best, as better, as bountiful. Any number of words could represent it. This kind of goodness and mercy, love or loving kindness, translations vary. Uh, the idea is that God's character is one, one that keeps every covenant with people. He keeps every promise to extend to people. His, his, his kindness, his affection, because he's the shepherd. He's the shepherd, so he does that. And if you memorize this in the King James, I think we talked about that last time. It says, truly goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Kind of gives you the impression of, you know, the pup, not out front, she's behind you, you know, wagging her tail, coming in behind. But that, that's not the idea of the Hebrew word at all. And this, uh, the uh, translation that I shared with you actually is, is a better rendition of it, that it pursues. The Greek word actually means to run after. Now, get a mental picture. The goodness and the loving kindness of the shepherd is running after you. picture that. God is in hot pursuit. Makes the, uh, the chase scene in the movie Bullet look minimal. God is going to pursue you all over wherever you go, wherever your life is, whatever happens to you. God is always in hot pursuit of who you are. And so, Jeopard, so, so, the, so David says... Yahweh, your goodness and your mercy, just always there. They're always there. And he says, because of that, I'm able to dwell. And the idea of dwell is I'm able to sit down. I can, I can rest where I'm at, what's going on, because you're the one who's in hot pursuit of me. Nothing happening in my life alone. God's pursuing me. And so I can set, settle down. The house, <laughs> the family of God, related to deity. Forever, I dwell in the house of the Lord forever is literally two different Hebrew words. One for length of days or age, and the other is the, the normal word for day, which has to do with the, the hot, the heat of the sun. So for an age of, of hotness, of hot days, God's just going to let me dwell there. I can dwell there. And as a result, 
Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on, when we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow for God, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all save the blessed we shall meet at last. That is a great song. And it, it sings the same melody as Psalms 23. Our God will do all of those things. I didn't research this, but you remember the movie, The Magnificent Seven? I think there was a remake of it then later on. But as I'm remembering, it's like Yul Brenner and Steve McQueen in the first version. And, and they're kind of taking on protecting uh, something that's going awry. And, and they're setting up and they're going to attack and they're going to plan all these, these uh, they're going to sneak, uh, sneak around and, pr- and provide for, for these folks. And, and as a result, don't, I think some of them get killed in the process, but they're the magnificent seven for what they're doing. Do you know what? Our God is the magnificent seven. He is the God that says, I am the shepherd. I'm the shepherd of my sheep. And, and, and they're in a situation which demands protection, which demands relief and oversight. And I'm volunteering to do this. And I'm not made up of the scoundrels of the Magnificent Seven movie. I'm the God of the universe. And so because of that, I am the person of Yahweh. I am the one who provides. I'm the, I have a purpose that I want their right, my righteousness to be in them. I make them promises. I will protect them. I will give them prosperity. And I will persistently provide for them a home. Our God. Seven points about the shepherd. Seven equals complete and full. The psalm presents us a complete and full picture of who our shepherd is. And we have reason to rejoice in that kind of care. If you're not a part of his fold, then Jesus invites you in. He says, my sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. And they come in and out. And he says, they're my sheep and they're also the father's. So if you need to come to Christ today and you understand the process of of bringing your obedience to the point where you become a part of that flock. We would love to help you do that. If you don't understand that, don't be afraid to ask because there's nothing more important than having the shepherd like Yahweh. And we get it through Jesus. So as we sing our song this morning, we do so by way of inviting you to make that uh, commitment if you need to and just making a, (laughs) revitalizing your heart to trust the shepherd, the one who's willing to do all of that just for you. Let's stand and we'll sing. And if you uh, have a need you'd like to express, thank you for taking the time to study with us. Subscribe to our channel if you'd like to be notified when new material becomes available. Also, we we love to study scripture. If you have questions that you'd like to discuss, if you have doubts about your standing with God, we'd love to get together and open the book. You're always welcome to come and assemble with us. We worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings at the corner of 56th and Vine in Lincoln, Nebraska.